Wall Street's promise to embrace diversity, starting from its workforce, has fallen short. That's at least according to a recent New York Times report that found Wells Fargo interviewed so-called diverse candidates for fake jobs, all to comply with diverse requirements. Now, other banks say there are more ways to create more systemic change. Joining us to discuss how to foster workplace diversity, let's bring in Terry Williams, One United Bank president and COO. Um, Terry, it's good to talk to you today. It's certainly timely because, you know, I think when, when the protest first happens in 2020, we all heard the public promises of diversity and inclusion. We're now two years on. What does that report card look like? Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the report card is is mixed. Um, we definitely have institutions that are, as I would call it, doing the right thing, you know, that they have invested in our community, um, whether it's in uh, MDIs or minority depository institutions or organizations that really support uh, the Black community, the Latino community. Uh, there are definitely corporations that have done that and have formed really what I would call sincere partnerships. Uh, but there are still some that, um, and it's unfortunate to hear uh, that news about the fake hiring, there are some that really um, have some work to do. <laughs> and, um, and then there's some that haven't done anything. So I would say it's really mixed. Hey, Terry, it's Brian here. I mean, what's the solution here? Because what happened at Wells Fargo seems to be not just a bank industry specific thing, but something I imagine a lot of other industries and companies are doing as well, where you're just trying to hit a checkbox on the applicants and not actually onboarding people who would bring on more diverse uh, viewpoints into management decisions within a company. Yeah. How do you make sure that pipeline is more robust as opposed to just checking the box? Yeah. Well, first of all, it definitely starts from the top. Um, leadership really matters. And the leadership really has to really understand that diversity can help your bottom line in addition to being the right thing to do. And if the leadership doesn't believe that, then it will be sort of a check the box kind of scenario. But companies that do believe that, that do recognize you need to have diversity around the table, that it does help to collaborate and, and really make, it helps you make better decisions. Like companies that really believe that actually perform better and that it's not a check your box. They actually are looking for um, the best candidates, but they're looking across a pool that is very diverse. If you don't have that commitment and that understanding at the top, it is going to filter down so that it will be a check the box scenario. And, and that's unfortunate. I mean, Terry, in many ways, it is about really understanding why diversity is important. And sometimes those lessons take a little longer instead of just one conversation, two conversations. We've got those like the NASDAQ, for example, uh, requiring two board directors to, to be, quote unquote, diverse candidates. I mean, do those kind of quotas, requirements, is that necessary, though, to get the ball rolling at least? I absolutely think it's necessary um, because I, I think what happens when you do have those directives uh, is that people pause and really start to say, OK, given this, how do we go about it? And let's start, uh, you know, interviewing, you know, doing outreach to an audience that maybe we haven't been doing in the past. So it definitely helps. Um, but. Again, if it's just to check the box, then you're going to end up having someone who is not really able to not just provide a, you know, sort of diversity. I, you know, I always say to people, I'm not just like a white person with a black face, you know, that I actually do bring a, an experience to the table that uh, may help you make better decisions. So I, I think it does help to have those directives, but I think in the end, you really do have to understand and believe that diversity uh, can make a difference. And Terry, you mentioned at the top of the interview about the importance of minority depository institutions out there. Uh, you are the largest Black-owned bank in the country. Um, there's not many Black-owned banks. In fact, the amount of Black-owned banks has shrank over time, as is ov overall community banks. Uh, what do you right. see as the need for the overall banking industry environment to support more banks like yours that can actually support the communities that really you would have a better pulse on those communities than perhaps the larger GSIBs, for example. Yeah, and to put it in perspective, there are about 4,000 banks in the U.S., and only 19 of us are black banks. So um, 
that, you know, just to give you a sense of the, of the size. Um, and we do matter. We do make a difference. There are a lot of programs that we introduce that are really tailored to our community um, that both uh, give banks an idea of things to do, you know, that could be helpful, um, but also hold everyone accountable. It's sort of like if this community bank, black owned, you know, largest black owned bank, but if we can do it, why can't you? You know, we just introduced a program that is called Cash Please. It's a short term dollar program to help people that doesn't require a credit check. Our goal is to reduce payday loans um, and to give people options. If we can do that, you know, large banks can do that as well. So it's not only just, you know, what we do for our community, but it's also really, you know, being like a canary in a coal mine or shining some light on some services that really could matter that large banks can duplicate.